Hello, everyone. Welcome to a live conversation. Today, we're interviewing Coajut about digital property market. Coajut platform connects all parties that involve in property transaction together in one place, from valuation and mortgage providers to the lawyers and the state agents. Coajut runs on the back end of their software. It's all about connecting and digitizing the whole process of buying a house. Stations, all of the parties connecting them via network. It's about to make sure that everyone agrees on the common protocol. It's about orchestrating the process and making sure everyone sees a correct document. It's about issuing a house on the. It's not about issuing a house on the ledger and moving on. So, and today our guests are John Reynolds, who is the founder and CEO of Codejude. He is a seasoned digital transformation director and called the DLT expert. John has a background in enterprise IT firms such as Dell and Fujitsu and with the UK government. And uh, we also interviewed Javier Diaz Ahia, who is a CMO and an award winning international brand marketer with 25 years of experience in senior roles in technology services firm um, and services firms. And our uh, so we will be interviewing uh, me, Irina, and Anthony. We are, are part of the developer relations team at R3. And please, if you have questions, uh, write them in the comments, and we will uh, address them during the interview. Anthony, do you want to start the first question? Sure. Yeah. Um, so welcome, John. Welcome, Javier. Um, as Irina said, I'm Anthony from developer relations and I'll be kicking it off. And just to jump into it, I'm gonna go right to Javier and then John, you can uh, feel free to jump in and support because I heard that something happened with your company that a major milestone, a mi major milestone of your company was actually Her Majesty's Land Registry. So there was a digital street proof of concept. Um, I'm really interested in this. So could one of you, uh, Javier, starting with you, can you give us an overview of what that project was? and how it came to be. Yeah, um, and uh, first of all, um, thank you so much, uh, R3, for inviting us to participate. For everybody in the audience, you guys should know that R3 and Kojut are, are, are sisters in arms, or brothers in arms, so we've been, we've been working with them for a long time now. I guess there are two parts of this question, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to focus primarily on the problem that exists today in the property market, and then I'm going to let John talk much more about that specific part, which was actually very successful with land registry. And this is what actually um, was the beginning of what Kojut is today. Is that okay? So um, yeah. for, for everybody in, in the audience, uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, they say that to get married, um, to find a new job and move in houses are the three more stressful things that you can do. So what Kojut is doing is addressing the whole buying and selling properties in the UK. And I don't know whether you can see uh, John's background, you know, that little painting he's in the background of these two people really frustrated. This is how buyers and sellers um, feel in, uh, in, in the UK property market today. You know, this is a sector that has been alive for, for many, many years and is very, very fragmented. I'm going to give you a couple of stats that they are ridiculous. The first one is the average time or the average time frame for someone to buy and sell a property, according to very recent reports, is six months. Okay, six months in other countries is a matter of weeks. In the UK is six months. Can you imagine everything that could go wrong? In six months. So that's the first step for you guys to remember why this is a crucial problem that we are actually. The thing is that two in three property transactions fail. Some of it is fine, it is uh, indirect, is because maybe the mortgage was not approved, but a lot, a portion of it, uh, it is very much due to the fact that this long period of time for buy, for people to buy and sell properties, a hundred things can happen. Okay, so um, the the point is the UK market is broken when it comes to the real estate, and the good news is that R three and Kojut are working together to fix it. 
um, COVID-19, uh, which is uh, very much a very unwelcome um, event in our history, has been actually a catalyst for digitalization in, uh, in the property market. And also the UK government on the 25th of uh, May has encouraged the real market to, to get to grips and digitize. So that is a okay. overview. Can I, okay, so coming from that overview, I have one question here, which I'm sure a lot of people are also wondering, is what is up with the UK? Like, why are we taking six months? What's the major barrier compared to other jurisdictions? Like, can you sort of like illustrate just in a very, um, like high level, like why are we so slow over here? So I would say, um, just to be very kind to the UK, because I, I've been here for the last 26 years, and although I do have a very thick Spanish accent, I love the country, I would say number one is we are behind digitalization in comparison with other sectors in the market, and also with, um, with, uh, with other countries. So I think that would be definitely number one. I think perhaps um, there is an element of convoluted when it comes to the process of surveillances, and conveyances, and just for everybody that just, just doesn't know the lingo, in real estate conveyances are the lawyers that will uh, specialize primarily on helping people buy and sell. So it could be quite convoluted. We know that, that the legal firms by nature are not very tech savvy. And, uh, and the, 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 the third thing I would say is that to some extent, the UK market for a long, long time, it was a market where um, it was primarily a rental market. Okay, I'm, I'm just talking about 15, 20 years ago. But of course, real estate now is an asset. So buying a property has boomed, but I don't think the, the whole infrastructure has followed that boom uh, over the last 15 years. True, true. Okay, so that's sort of like where the market's at. And then I think Irina has some questions related to this. Uh, if you could uh, tell us about the life cycle of property transaction. Yes. Um, so I guess many people in the call has been through buying and selling. Um, um, so you you start by really you as a buyer decide by you know I want to buy a property and then there is a seller out there that you don't know um, and then and, and then in between the buyer and the seller there are a number of parties involved. Okay, and there are many many parties involved. I'm just gonna pick a one simple example which is. I am a first time buyer, so no chain, and I'm going to buy it from somebody that has no chain. Okay, so that's the, a really simple example. <laughs> Between me buying and the other person selling, you will have a lender. So the lender, like Nationwide, Barclays, will be the guys that will give you a mortgage. You've been a good person. Uh, you will have an estate agent that will help you um, to uh, have conversations indirectly with the seller and will show you the properties and will allow you to, to in a way, uh, narrow your thinking and in some cases, they consult with you. So that's the second player, right? There is a third player, which is the broker. And uh, I would say that um, more than 70% of the buying and selling is done through brokers. Because as I said before, it, it is not, if you don't know the laws, if you don't know the process, if this is your first time, you need to rely on someone that gives you some coaching. So you've got the brokers. Um, then you've got the surveyors. And there are two types of surveyors. The surveyors that will be employed by the bank to ensure that they go to see the house and the house is valued properly. But then you've got the surveyors that, for example, me as a buyer, would like to employ to make sure that the house I'm buying um, it actually, it is what it is, and there is no damp, and there is no. And then, oh, sorry about that. The um, the, um, the and the, the final player will be the conveyancer. So the conveyancer are all the legal uh, companies out there that help you to buy uh, and sell and and, and buy the contract. So all of these parties have got very well oil engines. Um, so they operate very well in silos. They all have uh, CRM systems. They all have technology platforms um, that they know how to use. They know how to use them very well. They are happy. In, in, in multiple cases, they will have more than one of these CRM uh, players. Um, but what is not happening is 
the fact that once they leave the CRM system, when they leave their own little silo and they need to interact with another party, there is nothing out there that helps that communication except a phone call, an email, and any other type of even faxes in some in some cases in the UK. So what's happening? How, how, goes, how, oh, so, yeah, go ahead. So how is it like Kojut uh, sol solving this problem? Yes, so uh, two, two parts to that answer. I'll give you the high level one and then John will give you the blockchain answer. It's actually ingenious um, the way we are doing it because um, the last thing we want to do is, uh, is, is to disrupt the market. So blockchain is a very transformative uh, technology, but it's not a disruptive technology. And so what we are doing is we are thinking, okay, so I am an estate agent, I got my CRM system, I love it. Um, and what I don't want is to have another CRM system uh, and, and another platform. I want to be in control of my own data and on my own time. So what Kojuti is doing is um, adding a piece of functionality to an, an existing CRM system that they really like. And that is where blockchain plays a key role. So in a nutshell, what we are doing is you like your CRM system, you carry on working with it. We are going to add a little Intel. If you think about the Intel brand, we're going to add a Kojut uh, link to it. We are going to extend your functionality and that will allow you digitally to connect with all these parties that today are not connected. And John, maybe you want to just explain how it will work from a um, blockchain perspective with the different nodes and how the data is in control and yeah that's uh, I'll, I'll come on to that do you, do you want me to go on to that now uh marina or, or do you have some more business questions first yeah sure. yeah we, we we can go through this through yeah okay yeah super so uh, anthony you asked about the land registry and um as javier said that was the starting point for us um as, as the founder of the business, I've been very interested in DLT. Um, I've spent my whole life in a sort of enterprise IT and implementing uh, products that allow companies to run faster internally, uh, like CRM systems, you know, Salesforce, ServiceNow, Oracle, all, all of these systems. And, uh, it, you know, it's typically a, a day in the life of someone using one of those systems is you, you do your work in the system and then you let's say it's an invoice you download the invoice attach it to an email and send it to somebody and then they unattach it and upload it to their crm um so so that's just the way the world um was uh, and in 2016 i was trading uh cryptocurrency uh, and it, it was just one of those things that really fascinated me, the fact that if I send you a PDF, you know, I can send it to 50 other people. But if I send you a token on, on, the, you know, on the Ethereum network, it's, it's unique. And, and that was kind of like, oh, wow, OK, this is interesting. Uh, and, and maybe we could use this as a mechanism for helping businesses to, to stay synchronized, that they you know, don't want to have that kind of central uh, database. Um, so I was working in government at the time. and. Um, uh, it's particularly government, you know, if you think about in any country, you have you know, your health service, your prison service, your education service, and they're very different. And, and so the concept of one database to run all of that, it, it never worked. Uh, but maybe we could have a, an enterprise blockchain for government. That was the kind of initial idea. Um, so we did lots of research um, and we looked at all the public platforms and realized that, you know, putting government data like health records and prison records and those types of records on you know the ethereum platform um, and i know there's like the world is changing continuously but at that point uh, i just couldn't see how it would be possible or how you would pay for the gas you know are you going to have like genie accounts go and pay for gas to service the it services and what about the price spikes and all the rest of it so i kind of just couldn't get my head around that so then we started looking at the permissioned networks um and uh, we, we looked at a whole whole bunch and, and then we kind of came across R3 uh, called it. It was just the time you were open sourcing. And, and it was, you know, we just thought, wow, you know, this is this has been built by banks. You know, I, I read the white paper um, and I just that one picture in the white paper where you've got the kind of the world as it is today. And then that sort of shared application. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, th this is this is a really interesting solution for what we're uh, 
what we're trying to do. So I, I, I wrote to, um, I went on the website actually, I told Todd this and I, I looked at all the, all the exec team and I, I, I saw Todd's face and I thought, wait, he looks quite friendly. <laughs> I'll email him. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so everybody go to www.r3.com if you want to see Todd's face. Yeah, see who's the most friendly looking. Uh, which one would you email? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I picked Todd. And, you know, he's ended up just, uh, now looking after the product, so and it's a good choice. But Todd emailed me back, you know, a speculative email saying, hey, I know you guys are in capital markets, financial services, but we think you've, you've got a great product for government. And uh, Todd replied and uh, I went in and met with uh, Mike Ward and the team in, in, in London and we, we started talking about this use case. Um, and then in 2018, the UK Land Registry was the first government department to uh, go out with a public procurement, a, a European tender. Uh, as, well, there won't be many more of those for the UK, but that's what it was at the time, a European tender. Um, and, and what they wanted to do was they wanted a consultancy partner to help them explore how DLT could make the home buying process simpler, faster, and cheaper. Uh, and if you think about um, that for a moment, from a, from a data point of view, uh, Anthony, if you had a house and I wanted to buy it, what the land registry is doing is really quite a simple thing. There's a database. It's got your name next to it. It just needs to take your name off and put my name on. Like, that literally takes 30 seconds, right? Um, but it takes, as Javi said, six months. So so why is that? Is that because there's something wrong with the land registry database? Uh, the answer is no. The, the, issue, the land registry is just at the end. You know, the, the problem is, as Javi said, all of the systems of record, as is articulated in the R3 white paper, the systems of record are not synchronized. So you, you get a, a buyer or a seller interacting with an estate agent and they're keying stuff into their system but the lawyer doesn't know what's going on or they make an update update and the, and the estate agents know what's going on so what the land registry wanted to do was explore how dlt could make that process better so uh, we bid for that um all of the big consultancies bid for it um and, and we won which was you know that was phenomenal so uh we put together a uh, a really excellent team with r3 um and uh we, we, we went and built a bunch of POCs uh, with, with land registry. Um, and, and kind of as we went through that journey, we realized that there was nobody was building this kind of digital uh, backbone, this, this kind of shared ledger uh, for, the, for the UK property market. Um, and, and, and the land registry as a government um, entity are not gonna build you know, private infrastructure. They, they're kind of interested in their piece. Um, but they're not uh, interested in, you know, they, they don't build uh, you know, commercial applications. So, uh, so we pivoted into a, a product business and um, we, uh, we then, you know, we, we, we started our, our, our journey. But with Land Registry, what we learned very much in the laboratory situation, you know, as a POC, is that yes, if this um, shared ledger, if this digital backbone existed, it can really crunch the time of, uh, of of the property transaction, and uh, you know, got, got awesome feedback, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a great project. So, going to that project, I just have um, one curiosity and question here: is that um, you articulated sort of the core issue of sort of just having this underlying transaction which shouldn't really take this long, and I think the land registry, Her Majesty, a kind of a knew that or understood that and so did probably a leather a lot of other um uh you know like software vendors and solution providers as well that went for that bid with you and now i assume at that time where you initially got this first poc you were probably a relatively small company so i'd like to hear from your perspective like what was it that allowed you to communicate the value proposition or the solution that you were proposing to such an effective manner that had them like choose your company say like yes i want to go with with um, this company, I want to go with Corda. Like, what do you think was the kind yeah, of? Key? I, mean, I think there's there's a couple of pieces to that. So we're going back to the beginning of 2018. Uh, we're going back to um, November 2017. I, I I think I might have the dates wrong. Um, I think the price of Bitcoin was about twenty thousand dollars. I think that was like when we're just going for that crazy like ICO token hype cycle. Now, I didn't see the other bids, but there was certainly um, a whole conversation around 
put everything on the blockchain. You know, and there was a whole bunch of people said, hey, you don't need land registries. You can just put land registries on the blockchain. Um, and, and just as a, as a little aside, you know, if you were in a country where you didn't trust the government, where there were um, uh, issues of corruption uh, around land titles, so nobody in, in the UK expects to come home and there'd be somebody else sitting in the front room and saying, hey, I, I live here now, get out. Um, that doesn't happen. So that's not the problem we're solving. So, I, but I think a lot of people, when they started thinking about um, you know, land registry and blockchain, immediately that just jumped to, oh, we're going to tokenize the title. We're going to actually put the register on a blockchain. Whereas we looked at it very differently. We said, well, actually, the land registry is a centralized database. It's got a ring of steel around it. There's no problem with that. It's not getting hacked. Um, we trust the government. So there's not the issue is the business process. So I would be surprised if, um, and I might, might be wrong, if um, other um, bids, or at least uh, 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 there might be one or two, but the mass majority I think would be more about putting the register on the on the chain. So that was one. Um, the second piece um, was that with, with Corda, because it was built from the ground up for banks, it's got a couple of unique properties. It's got a, a flow framework, um, which, uh, I just think that ability to, if I'm if I'm buying, uh, if I'm involved in a property transaction with you, you know, with, with Corda, it's just a peer to peer. So only the people involved in the transaction can see it. Um, and clearly, as the land registry is a government department, uh, security, privacy, confidentiality is key. So we certainly majored very heavily on that in our bid to say, well, look, Corda was built for financial services. It's got these properties that allows it to exchange a digital currency. Um, and therefore, you know, we're going to apply that to this. So I thought that was, that was really important. And I think the third piece that was, uh, that was uh, compelling, it was the fact that um, R3 uh, it, it was born out of a, uh, a collaboration of banks. So one of our you know, key pieces that Land Registry wanted is they wanted a consultancy partner that would help them um, foster um, and, and continue to engage with their digital street uh, community. And, and we were able to really point very strongly to the fact that, you know, R3 had, had done that, it had built a collaboration of banks, it had a thriving open source ecosystem, and that we would take that, e that, uh, that, um, that spirit into, into the, the project, and, and, and we did. Nice. So for all those out there that are new to Corda, um, this is one of the things that I kind of like uh, promote and really cheer about is what um, John was talking about, the flow framework. So Corda as a platform actually has something called a flow library, which abstracts away a lot of the DLT functionality. So it allows you to leverage things like private permission network messaging without sort of like having to deal with nitty gritty things. Um, it makes it really kind of consistent and it also has a lot of um, security baked underneath, which you don't have to really attend to. But in addition to just the technical gains to a flow framework, I think what John kind of illustrated there was there's also this practical um, leveraging of being able to communicate what is happening on the platform. So when you go into a business meeting or when you're talking to stakeholders, it's kind of really complicated when you start bringing in all these like uh, uh, cryptographic proofs and all these like consensus algorithms and you start talking about all this mumbo jumbo which like necessarily um, the person you're speaking to doesn't really care about in that detailed manner. But when you're talking about flows, you're able to kind of communicate, this is what the outcome will be. This is what we're doing and this is how it works. Um, so that's really cool. I want to just address a couple of questions um, on the top chat and then I think Irina has um, some extra tidbits or some interesting things to ask you guys. So let's just address a few questions. I think we'll go to Javier for the first question. Um, so, uh, uh, Anthony, if you could, if you could please check if there are any questions from the audience, from YouTube comments. Yes, totally. That's what I'm looking at right now. And the first question, uh, well, there was a couple earlier up on the thread about lawyers. So um, coadjutant replacing the administrative administrative functions that the lawyers currently run. I can see that might be a little bit complex if they all have different um, underlying procedures or can somebody address that? Maybe Javier? Yes, and by no means. No, no, we are an enhancement to what they do today. 
So if you are a, a conveyancer, if you're a, a legal person, what you want to do is you want to drive um, additional revenues for your company. You want to spend more time with your customers, uh, but, but, but on, on real things, on, on, um, you want to begin to think about how you um, develop um, innovation within your law firm. The last thing you want is what they do today, which is they spend their time chasing conveyance, uh, uh, the, the state agents, the lenders, they spend all this time chasing what are we with this, what are we with this, what are we with this. Whereas our value proposition, which is terrific, is, um, is we are giving them an opportunity to interact with our platform, which is an open platform. Um, so they, they get a node that is connected and they, they, they can actually begin to digitally connect with everyone without having to chase people. And actually there is a much more interesting viewpoint uh, for a conveyance, but it's also from a consumer perspective. If you are a consumer, if you are a buyer or seller, you will call your lawyer and say, where are we, where are we, where are we? So you are constantly chasing. What we are going to develop also is a, um, um, a, a, a consumer app where you can actually track exactly where you are in the process. So if you see that the conveyancer has already done um, the, the job that is already marked, um, the, 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 then you can see where the rock block is. <laughs> Facing conveyances. On the contrary, we are giving them more time to do what they're supposed to be doing instead of just admin work and chasing people around. And, and I think um, Anthony, just to uh, 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 Irina, sorry, just to, to 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 build on that, and the way we're doing it from a technology point of view is through people's existing software. So the conveyances software they use today, and as Javier said, with the consumer app. These consumer apps exist today, and, and therefore we, we, we're building plugins uh, to those. So we're not uh, disrupting the market. We're not asking people to purchase new software. We're just empowering their existing software. So, uh, John, is it possible to compare your platform with uh, your competitors? Yes, uh, Avia, do you want to? Go yeah. Back? So a couple of things. Um, as I commercial guy, I will always welcome competition. I think competition drives innovation. So, but I would say that our biggest um, competitors are still the behaviors of the market player participants, which is what I indicated right at the beginning, why perhaps the UK is still a little bit behind other countries with regards to digitization, you know? So I, I, I do things this way and I'm, I'm not gonna change. So I would say that this is perhaps our biggest uh, competitor. I am not aware of any other company in the UK that has got a blockchain-based open platform that is not disruptive, that is connected directly to the CRM systems and they are very well established and is building a tremendous relationship with the seven, 10 uh, players that has got 90% of the market share in this, in this country. That's impressive. That's impressive. Uh -huh. so, uh, Anthony, is there any more questions from the audience? Totally. So there's a question kind of just following up on what you just discussed there, Javier. Uh, you have a fan out there. So somebody uh, looks like Brian D. He was really impressed um, with it, the importance of governance in consortia. So he says the challenges you had to overcome uh, I have been very impressed how you have dealt with these challenges and he wants to speak about who wants you to talk or articulate about um, what are the challenges in working uh, in a consortium with uh, established governance and how has your solution sort of like used that um, challenge as more I see it as like a strength to your solution so you've been able to bring this consortium together and work it within this infrastructure. So yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, so well, I, I think the. Um... I'll just I'll just sort of start and then uh, hand over to Harry. So I think we've um, got a community of of partners who are working um, together. Um, what we haven't done, and I think a lot of our early blockchain initiatives try to do this, is to build a, a bit like R three. If you think about it, you actually build a, a legal entity which is a consortium, um, and that legal entity then has you know I don't know. 20, 30 people, businesses involved in it. 
And trying to uh, build a platform like that is very challenging, very slow. Um, so what, what we did is instead of trying to do that and to build all the pieces, we said, well, actually, the pieces already exist within the marketplace from a technical level. We've got estate agency systems, you've got conveyancing systems, you've got lending systems. And then there's, there's, a, there's a piece of integration, an integration layer that's missing that we're building. And we're building that and offering that as a SaaS service. So I think uh, the, the, way to, the, way to, the way we've managed to get speed is to not try and build this monolithic consortium that does everything, but rather focus on one key piece, which is connectivity. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that because we are moving away from the whole consortium idea that is not applicable to what we're trying to do. We are a, a very agile business and business model, but the importance of community is key for two reasons. Uh, Cojude means to cooperate. And, and second is the way we are cooperating is with these uh, five to seven already CRM providers that own pretty much 80 to 90 percent of the market share. And with them, we are building the roadmap. We already got three applications. And with them, we are building roadmap. And it's actually interesting how willing um, they are to cooperate. And they are giving us ideas for, ah, have you thought about you know, these, these other bridge that, that originally we didn't think about? So that sense of community uh, is about collaboration, which is one of our values. It is the name of the company. But it is also going to be a perfect sounding board for us to carry on um, um, our growth uh, trajectory. John, is it possible to elaborate how large is the uh, market uh, for digital property? Uh, how, how large is it? How large is the market for digital yeah, uh, So the, the UK property market in, in, a, in a typical year would have um, 1.2 to 1.4 million uh, transactions. Mm -hmm. um, the average uh, house price is about 240k. Um, so you know it's a it's a it's a huge it's a huge huge market. Now, obviously, this year with, with COVID, the transactions will be down a little bit, but uh, yeah, a, a very big market with over a million transactions and, and, and billions of pounds. So related to that market, somebody had a question which is very tied to that. Who will buy Coadjut? Uh, who do you sell it to? What do you sell? Uh, I guess what do you sell has already been covered a little bit. Um, but sort of like your primary customers or who you expect to be your customers in the future? So uh, our, for now, uh, because we, we, we got, a, a, if you want a, a three horizon view, in the next two years, um, what the, our go-to-market is a three-prong go-to-market approach, right? So first we've got a high-touch uh, uh, collaboration. I, I just don't want to call it sales. We've got a high-touch uh, collaboration with the CRM providers to state agents and to conveyances. So we are going to start from this group because the, the, this, um, from a platform perspective, will um, build the network effect. Um, and so that is that's one. So we empower them to sell to their customers, which are the state agents and conveyances, by giving them videos or training materials, collateral. That's, that's number one. Number two is we are doing joint marketing activities with these partners, you know, with the CRM providers, so we can go directly and talk to, to their users, which are the state agents and conveyors. So a good example is we got a LinkedIn um, um, campaign where we are targeting already uh, state agents, and the main objective is brand awareness around what blockchain is, around the functionalities, and about the benefits of it. And the third um, um, go-to-market approach is go directly to consumers. That's what we are going to see the pool. So you, Anthony, I don't know whether you own a house or, or, or an apartment or whether you would like to own it in the UK, but in the end, what we would like you to go to your estate agent and say, okay, so I'm going to buy a house, but I want the Kojut app because I want to see you know, exactly where we are in the process. I'm not going to spend three months buying it. I want to spend half of it. So we think that we think that we are actually everyone is telling us it will be foolish to ignore the consumer base. They are going to be pulling uh, traction and they are going to be demanding state agents and conveyances to have that application. Then for them, it is a very small thing, but for the industry as a whole, it's huge. And I, and I think, uh, you know, Javier mentioned at the beginning, uh, Anthony, that concept of Intel inside. Um, so we're, we're 
we, we've recently just signed a, another letter of intent with their consumer facing app provider. And yeah, we, we, yeah. we expect that that will be one, but over time, consumers will be saying, look, do you take Visa? Do you have Kajut inside? We're not building the end application or the end portal, but we will be inside and powering that connectivity. Javier, I would totally be on it. Javier, you mentioned that it will take uh, half of the original time uh, to buy a property if if uh, user if uh, buyer uses uh, call code. Is it is it correct? Yes, uh, we really feel that uh, I'm not going to go for the six months. Um, um, because that, that that will actually even be more than 50%. But if you go for a three months to four months, we believe that we're going to have um, the speed of buying and selling. Perfect. Yeah. Anthony, is there more questions from our audience? Let's see here. Um, a few late joiners have asked a few questions here. Uh, do, 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 there's a practice to transfer on the here. Uh, somebody saw a live demo. There wasn't a question there. Oh, we have a question aimed at John here. Can you outline what the difference in principle is with Kojute versus the HMLR, Her Majesty's Land Registry, previous projects and attempts like the Matrix or Veil? So I'm guessing Matrix or Veil was sort of like earlier attempts at POCs, perhaps. Um, does anybody have any information about um, those sort of things? Yeah. Um, so. If we take um, Matrix and, and, and Veo, how did they try? So we're trying to solve the same problem. Um, and the way they tried to solve it was with a centralized uh, platform. So I think the, uh, the idea is really, really super idea. So um, I wasn't really close to those projects, but I, I understand about them in the round. So in the round, it, it, what they tried to do was create a central platform. So if you imagine you're, uh, you're moving home and um, say you're, you're, you're buying a house um, and you're buying my house, you could log on to those platforms and you could see what was going on, assuming that your estate agent, your conveyancer, your lender, your broker also logged on and, and put the information into this platform. So it's like a, a central source of truth. So, of course, that would be awesome if you had one single source of truth. And that's what we're trying to create. So that's how they did it. It was one central platform. Everybody put the information in there and then everybody could stay in sync about what was going on. I think one of the challenges with, with that is that what you're doing is you're creating this one like monopoly in the marketplace. And we've seen that in Australia where there's an organization called uh, PEXA. Um, and again, not from that market and I, I don't really know anything about PEXA, I'm not commenting on them specifically, but uh, there's been a lot of conversations there about now there's a monopoly position so I think the existing software providers and the existing market participants um, to create a data monopoly, and I think even more now with all of the kind of, you know, the Facebook and all of that, I think it's a, it, the industry is not going to be comfortable with the data monopoly. So effectively creating one platform everybody uses and stops using what we use today um, is not realistic. Or you use what you use today and then you turn around and you double key into the other system continuously. So the other system's never really quite up to date. So that's what they tried to do. It was a kind of a central, what they call a destination platform. So everybody goes to that destination, the same destination, puts the information. What we're doing is we're saying, well, you don't need to do that. With a distributed ledger, you can get the same outcome. So we're creating a virtual shared ledger where we keep in sync all of the different systems. So you use the system you're using today, uh, it's integrated into this virtual shared ledger, this kind of virtual deal room, if you will. Um, from your system, you publish the events into the virtual deal room and you read the events from it. So we're creating a decentralized matrix, a decentralized VAO, all of those systems have tried before. And I suppose just the one difference, with those systems, there was also a front end. We don't have a front end. We're just creating really the back end of them, this, this virtual space where people can publish information to which is uh, decentralized, safe, and secure. Okay, okay, I get that. That sounds really, really good. Um, so I'm gonna have one more audience question before I pass it back to Irina, um, and she'll ask you the next round of um, tantalizing questions. But 
here's the question. Um, and I'm going to put in my two cents too after I read this because I have an idea about this. Um, and I think Javier will probably address this after. Um, will consumers really pull so hard given even a real estate professional may only buy and sell a family home two to three times in a lifetime. Um, so right off the bat, my two cents to this is I think the solution will have traction with um, basic, basically the consumer market. And the reason I think that is because I'm from Canada and we have something called uh, uh, provincial, we have provincial licensing for uh, purchases of vehicles for automotive. And one of the things, one of the services that sits on top of that, or like in the middle of it, is something called a VIN search. So whenever I want to buy a used car or buy it anywhere on the private market, I can um, basically pay like X amount of dollars and I can get a VIN search on all the liens on what the status of that car. Is that thing in salvage? Is it like insurable, et cetera? And that's not something that's offered um, by the individual provincial licensing agencies, but that's something that it got to the point where it was so um, pertinent and so informative to have that information from third parties. So we have a few third party um, providers of this service that everybody does it. And on top of that, the provincial agencies actually recommend that procedure through their documentation. So it's kind of like the symbiotic relationship. So in my idea, this could happen with your industry, I'm not sure, but I'll pass it to Javier to talk about the consumer market. Yeah, I think it will happen. And I think you actually have already began to unveil what we want to do long-term with the, with the business strategy. So we already started with estate agents and conveyances, but then we are immediately moving to brokers and lenders. But I think also, Anthony, the, the number of adjacent services around the real market, right? The, the, real, the, the, the property market, you got insurances, you got uh, reinsurances, you got credit rating agencies. So you got an entire system that eventually could actually plug in. Uh, and then and, and, and you can almost, and I, I, just, I just don't want to fantasize now because that would be fantasy. You can almost beginning to think about advertising uh, ways to, you know, you know for, for them just to advertise on, on the platform. But yes, I think um, I do see that eventually what it, it begins to be a transactional application, it could be become potentially a, another source of revenue for adjacent services around the, the property market. And I also think that there will be a good way to, through predictive analytics, which it is something we are already doing, and AI is for um, for uh, consumers to decide which estate agents they want to use because they could see their ratings, uh, which conveyances they want to use because they could see their ratings. Um, so I do think that uh, that that the opportunity is uh, is huge in the consumer. And there is like another good question: uh, Will Kojet orchestrate all the payments that take place during a typical property transaction? Yes. Yeah, so um, after we finish the uh, land registry uh, um, POC, we moved on and we did a, a global quarter trial. It's the largest quarter trial that was ever done, um, and we had 40 nodes deployed over 22 uh, countries, including including Canada. And um, we had a digital currency. So we had a token that represented uh, the, the, and, uh, the, the, the finance on ledger. It was as a promissory note. And that went into the smart contract. And then uh, at the end of the process, you had instant instant settlement. And, and that's, that's hugely valuable because uh, the movement of money in the property transaction uh, is, is really high risk, um, it's slow, and also when you have multiple transactions backing up, you need the money to clear in this one and clear in that one and clear in that one. So it typically happens on a Friday. But this concept of being able to settle anytime, 24-7, seven, you know, is, uh, is really valuable. However, having said that, um, in this release and what we're doing now, we're focusing on the, the workflow um, piece, but certainly with all of the uh, ever increasing and accelerating interest in digital currencies, uh, building on the quarter platform, which is now becoming the kind of de facto uh, platform for digital currencies. Uh, we see that, as Javier said, there are multiple horizons, but we see that um, law firms, uh, solicitors, lenders um, would want to, over time, uh, settle the financial leg of the transaction on, on Ledger as well. Thank you so much. And uh, I wanted to ask uh, uh, John uh, why you chose Coda and if you considered any other platforms. 
Uh, yes, uh, so we, we looked at all of the public platforms, I say all of the public platforms, but uh, uh, quite a number of them. Um, I mean, I, I've worked on you know, simple projects like Office 365 in, in government, right? If you want to put Office 365 in government, it's a really onerous task. Um, it, probably a bit better now, but you know, there was real concern about, you know, where's the data, which data center is, is the cloud safe? Um, so like moving to the cloud, it, it's, it was a big deal. And this is only like three, four, five years ago, massive deal and, and really like a uh, slow process. So the concept of a public um, uh, network where you have to pay with gas, where you could download a node in an embargoed country um, and see the data. So that was just a kind of, that wasn't ever going to happen. So then we looked at the um, uh, permission platforms and, and clearly there are different choices. Um, and, and we ended up with quarter, I mean, I think on a personal level, uh, we're, we're kind of more from a product business background. The flow framework is just something that you kind of go, ah, okay, I get it. It's like business process orchestration. So that was a really big thing for us. Um, the quality of the documentation was a really big thing for us. Um, and that, that seems small, but at that time, when we were looking online for architectural drawings, um, you know, the key concepts, how to stuff, well, all of that stuff, it wasn't as easily accessible for a lot of the other platforms we look at. And then you they turn up with the R3, you know, docs.corda.net, and you go, ah, okay, now as an enterprise person who spent 20 years in enterprise IT, I recognize the language, I recognize the quality. I can, this is something I could put in front of an enterprise CTO um, and, and, and they would buy into it. And then I suppose the thing we really liked is also, you know, Java. Um, you know, if you want to grow an enterprise business, you've got to be able to talk to people about technology they understand and skills they understand. So, you know, talking about, I don't know, a, a public network with gas and, and a programming language is not that well known and that there have been hacks as opposed to talking about, you know, quarter, it's got a firewall, it's built on Java, it's got flows, it's, you know, it, it felt like something we could take into the enterprise and that's always what we wanted to do. So, so I think it was, it was enterprise ready. That's why we chose it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also we have to told on his pretty face on quarter.net. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> just I to throw in a little pretty, just to get that clear. <laughs> yeah. And just to throw in a little tidbit of there, because a lot of that answer was about how easy it is to get started and to get going with the platform. Um, it wasn't available when you guys started, John, but currently just a few like just in uh, when was this release? End of May, we actually released something called training.corda.net. So once you have the key concepts, once you have that um, sort of like uh, documentation on how things work and where you want to go, when you're actually hitting the grindstone and start coding, you can go to training.corda.net right now and it'll walk you through um, a stepwise uh, incremental learning process. Like it's a full course. We got um, seven modules and basically it'll get anybody from scratch up to the point where they can deploy real live court apps. So, um, yeah, and, I mean, I, I should also add to that, Anthony, one of the things that R3 had, and we were maybe uh, the first ones through this, uh, you know, there's the uh, entrepreneurs and residents. Um, I, I think we, we kind of were offered, like, come and work out the office for a while, John, and we, we moved in and um, then we became EIR. So I think a program might be built kind of around us. We, we never left, you know, <laughs> they couldn't get us out. But, uh, and that was good. But then there was the, uh, the Ventures team were formed. Um, and you have, you know, Fiverr and David and, you know, all of these things. Because I think if you're building a, a, you know, a DLT SaaS business like we are, there's the technology and there's awesome support from Corda. But you also need to know how to take your product to market. And I think the, the venture, the, uh, the quarter trials, all of this stuff that's been built around productionizing and taking your, your product to market is, 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 is really super and people should uh, should check that out as well. Yeah, yeah, they do an amazing job. Yeah, like to to put together all the startups and help them. Yeah, it's it's pretty valuable. And uh, John, do you have like a, do you think like you can point out which uh, comp components of Corda were the most useful for your business? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's
I'm trying not to go over what I've gone over before. So in terms of, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the flow frameworks, the, uh -huh. there's always been this kind of concept with Corda of mm -hmm. uh, off ledger integration. You know, uh, for us, we're, we're, we, you know, people talk a lot about blockchain interoperability, like how do blockchains talk to each other? And I, I kind of always found that an interesting, but kind of bit of a sort of side conversation, because the reality is, how does blockchain, how do blockchains talk to the rest of the databases that exist? Um, so I, I think that uh, ability to you know, integrate and connect to the node, simple mm -hmm. APIs and to trigger flows and to trigger mm -hmm. updates. Mm -hmm. uh, I think more recently, quarter accounts has been a big thing for us, um, being able to have multiple identities on the node. Uh, that's been really important because, you know, we're not modeling one bank, we're modeling like thousands of state agencies, right? So uh, I, I think the, uh, you know, the flow frameworks, uh, the the, the, accounts, the the easy integration, and the fact is enterprise ready, you know, Corda Enterprise comes with a whole, you, you can you can talk about kind of open source, quick, easy, get going, build your POC. But if you really want to get into the enterprise, you know, you need enterprise support. So you've got Corda Enterprise, you've got full support wrap around the node, in the firewall, you've got backups, you know, all of that enterprise activity and, and, and then the, the sort of, you know, being able to have a kind of uh, an enterprise support partner can put a managed service around that. I think it's 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 all of that. It's, it's all of that. It's a clear journey into production, it's clear uh, architectural patterns um, and, you know, that it's it's all of those, all of those components. Just to clear, uh... For our audience who does no accounts, it's ability for a node to host several parties. So it's a great way to scale your business. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, is there any more questions from the audience? Um, let's see here. Okay. So do, 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 do. there's one about fraud. This is pretty interesting. So UK property transactions are one of the largest targets of fraud annually. How will Coadjute deal with the current huge issue around cyber fraud and phishing that occurs directly with law firms. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, that's that's a that's a great, great question. Um, so let, let's just take a couple of couple of scenarios. Um, so typically, uh, email business email compromise is a you know is a is a big deal. So often on a home moving journey. It, it can be a little bit like this. You can kind of deal with the estate agent, like, ah, oh, okay, you call John, send us some stuff. And I might go into my Gmail and um, then send, upload my passport and pay slips and all, and all sorts of stuff, um, or, or proof of ownership, or whatever it might be. It, it, the same with the lawyer and the same with the broker and the same with the, with the lender. Uh, and we did a pilot, uh, which we, we just completed, where we integrated, um, we had a NatWest uh, node, we had a, a conveyance of nodes, uh, uh, red brick software. We had a uh, an estate agency nodes, uh, Desred software. And we had a surveyor node uh, with uh, CoreLogic eTech, um, and then we had a, a a consumer application. And so, what happened in that journey is that the uh, consumer would uh, take snaps of their uh, photos of their uh, documents that were required for the process and upload them securely to uh, the one of the nodes on the on the network. Um, I think in that instance we're using the lender node. Um, now, a question I can hear people going, "Oh, self sovereign identity? Why aren't you using that?" Well, what we've always thought about is let's try to have this as a transformation. And 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 the way that the uh, the business policies are at the moment is people need to see the actual you know a scan of the document. So you know um, proofs and all that sort of stuff is just not viable. So technically it is, but practically the policy isn't allowed. So we needed to get the actual scanned image onto the network. So we do that via secure app. Nice thing is once that's on the network, it's on one of the nodes. And therefore you can see, ah, now I'm the lawyer and I want to see um, your proof of address. And I can see that's on another node. So I can request that. And then one click, you go share. So what that does is it takes the data from node one, it will encrypt it and send it over a secure TLS connection, unencrypt on the other node, and then push it into the system. So there is no possibility of business email compromise within that. So 
we are encrypting and sending data securely around this network. So once the information's on the network, it's, uh, it's secure. There's a whole bunch of other um, data validation steps that go in. So you begin to triangulate that, you know, is this data is put in here? Um, obviously with the ledger, you're, you're building, aren't you, all the time on, on, on the data. And you've got the chain of provenance of the data. So therefore, if people wanted to sort of uh, accidentally or maliciously change the data, we will throw an exception to say, well, that's not the same as it's got on these other two nodes. And so there's lots of, um, um, lots of opportunities to really eradicate fraud when you stop having individual data sets that are interacted with by one entity and you right. bring them together into this virtual shared ledger and you have that as a really secure encrypted environment and you put the consumer back in control because they go share and they're not doing it themselves they're just going to share and, and from Javier's point of view back to you know this picture here um, we got 15 consumers that were in the process of going through a mortgage and we brought them in and we installed the application on their phone and we sent them away to uh, go through a property transaction uh, and, and they loved it you know they said it's amazing i only have to give my data once i don't have to keep giving it multiple times uh, it's safe it's secure it's uh, it's seamless so definitely uh, dlt has really been designed to remove to try to remove fraud so lots of opportunities there awesome so i also it also came to my attention that I've gone the whole interview. I, you, we have never met before. This is the first time we've all met, and I really had no idea how to actually pronounce Kojut. So Martin has so graciously um, informed me that I can't stop slurring and saying like Koajut, Koajut, or whatever. I should be saying Kojut or Kojuti. Um, I'm not sure. But either way, they both sound good. So I have <laughs> one, thing <for> the, <laughs> one, one thing related to um, uh, squashing fraud. Um, I'll just put out for the audience who maybe isn't familiar with a huge difference with Corda and say permissionless blockchains out there is um, if you're looking at something like Ethereum or whatever, everybody has a pseudo anonymous identity. So there's no way to real really tie a particular address to a legal entity in the real world, which is one of the strong things uh, about a Corda network is that every actor or every counterparty that's brought onto a particular solution has to go through a KYC process and in return is issued a well-known identity. So these are things that can be enforced in the legal um, realm and that are basically, you can't escape. Like everybody, when, when somebody decides to go on Ledger and put through a transaction, all the parties involved in that transaction will be able to um, identify and know exactly where that signature is coming from, where that authorization is coming from. So that's, uh, uh, in addition to all the awesome things that John mentioned there, that's one thing that right off the bat you get. And that kind of leads me to my next question for you guys. Um, so deployment, let's talk about like, where is the solution going? So Corda, actually you have the option to deploy your network in a siloed fashion or have sort of a, a private network if you want. Um, there's also something called the Corda network, which is an option for deploying Corda apps or Corda app uh, solutions through a business network or a sub entity on that. Now, um, for the future of Kojute, are you gonna be on a Corda network or will you be doing your own sort of like siloed? <laughs> There's a leading question. <laughs> <laughs> we're siloed, definitely. Um, no, no. Uh, we're, um, yeah, we're on the quarter network. So we built the pilot on the uh, on the quarter network, and uh, we're launching uh, at the end of the year release one on uh, on the quarter mainnet. Uh, we we'll have our sandbox uh, launching also at the end of the year on the uh, quarter uh, UAT net. Uh, and the reason for that, why that's important for us, is you know, having said about um adjacent services so you know insurance um digital currencies there's, there's a whole, whole bunch of stuff we have no intention of building this stuff right but when you're on a you know let's describe the internet of value you know an open ecosystem of, of of businesses that can provide different services the fact that these i mean our network is is open and i think it's important to realize open doesn't mean anonymous it's open but we need to know, you know, if you if you want to come onto the network, there's a key KYC process, and we know all the business that are on there. Um, and we will interact with other open networks that are also permissioned, so you know, insurance providers, banks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So most definitely, uh, yeah, the quarter mainnet. 
Thank you so much. So we have like one minute left. So I'll ask the last question. How people can find out more about Kojut and try it out? <laughs> okay. So um, if you go to www.kojut.com, you can see a very old uh, Hager website that we are now revamping for the next uh, two or three months. And we are planning a major overhaul of the um, staging website from September onwards. But of course, they can always come and talk to R3, uh, because I know that in R3 um, website, if you go to the real estate, we have been featured there. Um, and, um, and yes, through LinkedIn, uh, where we are very active. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, John and Javier, for an amazing interview and for asking all of, uh, answering all our questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for that joining. That was perfect. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thank you, audience. Bye. Thank you. you. Uh, thanks, uh, everybody. Thank you. I just want to say that we have a next live conversation with the Born 180 in two weeks. Please join us. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.